Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming out for today's discussion of the swimmer. Uh, as you undoubtedly uh, anticipated, we are joined by Lisa DeKnight, who gave us a, a very thoughtful introduction to the film. How are you doing, Lisa? Doing well. Thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you for suggesting uh, this film. Uh, it's one that I imagine not a lot of our patrons have seen, and I think um, it's a very interesting one. So I look forward to our discussion. Uh, but some rules before we uh, get going, uh, please keep yourself muted. Uh, unless you are asking a question or making a comment, you will know it is your turn to ask a question or make a comment because I will call on you. How will I know to call on you, you might ask? Well, as you can see from the slide my colleague has put on uh, her screen that she's sharing, uh, you can use the raise hand function and I will see people whose hands are raised and I will call on them. And at that point, please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. And then please remute yourself. And I would ask you to please um, keep your comments or questions as brief as you can so we can make sure to get to everybody. Um, we also will be using the chat function tonight. Um, my colleague, Jill, will be monitoring that. So please introduce yourself to us or to the group. Um, and uh, as always, we are very interested to know where people are from, if they are from outside the greater Philadelphia area. We uh, might have people joining us tonight from as far away as England. And I think I can almost guarantee at least one person from Texas, a little birdie told me. So uh, we wanna know where you're from. Uh, and uh, if you wanna let us know where you're from and give us a, a message about where you are, um, what you think of our work, et cetera, et cetera, please visit our website and in the film studies online section. We have a where in the world um, prompt and you can uh, put a little message in there and let us know where you're from. And uh, we, we'd love to hear from you all uh, in general and, and hear what you're up to and how you found our programs and so on and so forth. I see folks from Florida, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, we have a couple of folks at least uh, on here from Florida. I assume it's the state of Florida and not the small town of Florida, New York. Um, so that's, that's really great. But Florida, New York would be cool too because that's not exactly close. Um, in any case, uh, we can, I think, begin to get to the movie uh, and, our, and comments on the movie. As is often the case, uh, we have David with his hand up first. Hi. I, I do like to start out, and as uh, you may have noticed, I also sometimes like to talk about the music as one of the issues. Um, I guess if we didn't know who the, uh, uh, the composer was, we would probably think this was really interesting and, and good music. I was a little bit um, uh, intrigued by some of the upbeat music periodically uh, as uh, Burt Lancaster's character continued to sort of spiral downward. And I was trying to decide whether or not he was trying to uh, lift us back up periodically. Uh, and as, as you uh, come into the comments, uh, clearly there are many things that we don't actually know uh, as we're going along, but we get all of these hints. And uh, was wondering if you would comment on why there are so many unknowns when we get to the fence and get to the house um, uh, and, and what we were really trying, what, what, the, what the director and the writer were really trying to uh, lead us to be, beside the idea of uh, sort of the midlife crisis that uh, he's going through. And thank you for the choice again. Uh, Lisa, do you wanna start off with that? What were we um, supposed to come away with, uh, at least in some sense from the film, do you think? For the next 40 nope. hours, let me take you to the map because Guess there's some background noise there. Yep. Um, well, I, I expected you to bring up the score. Thank you very much for not disappointing right at the start. Um, it, the score is, I, I was talking to Andrew beforehand, the score is bonkers. Like, it's just a, a crazy score and it's, it's very fitting, I think, uh, because there's just this, this crazy, um, you know, amalgamation of, of emotions, highs, lows, uh, in this fractured mind of, of Burt Lancaster and Ned Merrill. And it's all kind of manifested in this schizophrenic score. There, there are 
little moments you know throughout the film where uh, Ned is kind of reclaiming his you know self his manufactured self identity and finding you know some shred of of you know contentment or happiness to kind of shroud his problems and that's so noticeable in the score and I I love the craziness of the score. I feel like it's very apt for the character and for, for the, the massive um, psychological and, and philosophical, um, you know, metaphors uh, and, and themes on display as well. Uh, so that's my, my thought on the score. And as for the, the ambiguity, um, that's, that's really coming from Cheever. Cheever's short story uh, on which this was based is, if, if you had the, the opportunity to read it. And I, I know a lot of you did, which is great to hear. Um, the, the story is so ambiguous and you actually learn more about Ned Merrill through the course of the film than, than you do um, in the story. And I, I feel like the, the film's ambiguity and desire to, to not over explain uh, is its greatest asset. I don't think it would have been the same film at all or successful even as a film or as an adaptation to have explained any more than it did. Um, I, th I think regarding the score, I think that um, there are a movie about one character, primarily about one character, the way this one is, tends to, in, in, in my experience, tends to sort of favor that character's perspective, that character's feelings, the character's insights. And while I think this movie is interested in what Ned Merrill is feeling and how his interactions with his neighbors, you know, make him feel, I don't think we get any sense of his, we don't get much of a sense of his internal, um, his internal, you know, mentality, turmoil, whatever. I think that there's an extent to which this movie is told and it's weird because it's a very, it's a very subjective and sort of impressionistic movie, but there's something about it that is ob objective and that it, um, there's not a lot of sort of, I don't feel primacy given on his point of view, on his perspective, and that we see these things happening and we see these things unfolding and we hear what he says and we some hear what other people say about him and things like that. But those aren't ever sort of internalized by us as viewers because we're not forced into the same level of identification with Ned as we might be in other movies. And so this is all by way of saying that I, I think some of those upbeat moments of the score can be explained by the fact that the film isn't always focusing on how Ned feels. It is focusing on its depiction of this journey. And sometimes there are beautiful things in the journey. Sometimes there are little moments of joy, um, even within his larger moments of, you know, melancholy or, or despondency or what have you. So um, I think in some sense, the, the kind of eclectic mood of the score makes, makes a little bit of sense to me. Um, regarding what we're, we're meant to come away with, I, I think that this is, you know, I, I think I, I almost, almost always hate it when a movie tells us what it's about, right? I feel like that is weak screenwriting and weak filmmaking. Um, and it's one of the worst things in the world, but it's only the, like a lot of things in movies, it's only the worst thing in the world if you notice it's happening in the moment, right? And I feel like this movie in part is about what Ned says to that little boy whose parents have left him alone with the empty pool and the lemonade stand, which is, you know, don't be so upset that you weren't picked. If you're not picked, you know, you're the captain of your own ship. You can chart your own course. And he's, Ned's doing that. And he's being confronted with or pelted with the opinions of his neighbors and 
their views of his past actions. Um, and those are having some impact on him, but they're not sinking his ship because he's not, he's not letting them. And I think that beyond sort of, you know, a fallen successful suburban man and beyond the sort of things we're used to um, movies in movies that show us the suburbs aren't so wonderful. Um, I think this movie is also about that, that there's only so much power others can have over you and you, you have to, to an extent, let them have it in, in many cases. Uh, sorry, I went on for so long there. Um, <laughs> Lisa, did you think of anything else while I was talking besides probably like your supermarket list or whatever? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It was, it was very well said. Very well said. Well, that's very nice of you. Let's see. Um, Charles, do you have a question or comment? Oh. Oh. Go ahead, Charles. Um, I thought that your timing was excellent based on the question last week that we had about films being dated. This film to me was very dated. We saw it in 1969. We saw it again last week and really didn't like it very much. And there were a couple of reasons for that. The visuals, I thought, were extremely dated. The almost... Uh, almost psychedelic stuff was very dated. The music, I would have stripped out all the music and I think it would have made a big improvement. Um, I think Marvin Hamlish did the music, but it wasn't really up to his standards. Um, I also thought that it, it uh, we needed to give credit to Bird Lancaster because you can imagine doing take number 48 when he's in his bathing suit. I think that would have been pretty stressful. Uh, overall, there were parts of it that I liked, most of it I didn't like. Okay. Uh, well, well, thanks for your, your comments, Charles. Um, I, I do think it's fair to say that the film um, is definitely uh, of its time and you can pretty easily identify it as being of its time. Um, I think that that isn't necessarily always a bad thing. Um, you know, sometimes you can tell a piece of furniture is, is old and the way they make f the features furniture has now might, you know, a piece of furniture might have now might be better, but there is something to be said for this thing that is representative of its era. And I think it is very representative of its era. And I think Lisa made a very important point that um, I guess I kind of knew implicitly, but didn't think about explicitly the first time I saw the movie, but did this time because Lisa mentioned it, which is how this movie is, a, is really a bridge, a bridge between classical Hollywood cinema, the, the studio system and um, you know, new Hollywood and that sort of iconoclastic writer, director, independent, you know, um, rare point of view or rare, you know, kind of personal storytelling that, that the movies would take on. Um, I just saw in the comments, someone mentioned that this movie had elements that reminded him of The Graduate. And I think that's very true. And it came out a year after The Graduate. It was shot a year before The Graduate, but it came out a year after. So I, I think that you know, it, it is very much of that time. Uh, Lisa. You know, I would never disagree with anyone who finds this film to be too dated to fully embrace or enjoy. Um, I, I think that there is probably a reason that Frank Perry is not as, you know, idolized and canonized like the other late 60s, early 70s, filmmakers, you know, Arthur Penn or Mike Lee. I, I think there is a reason and maybe it is because he, he was too much of his era and his filmmaking techniques um, 
approaches to to exploring themes, etc. That being said, that this film to me, and I, I think you you said this in, in your comment, um, it is just so timeless and timelessly excellent because of Burt Lancaster, and, and not you know, necessarily because he had to do Take Forty Six running on gravel, uh, but certainly his his willingness to degrade his body <laughs> is is a very important part of this film and why it works. But Burt Lancaster is to me a large part of, of why this film is just as exciting and, and heartbreaking and fascinating to watch today as it was in 1968. Um, I just saw the comment in the chat how the someone said the zooms into his eyeball were dumb or stupid. And um, I, I think that that is very, very much a technique of that era. Um, you see it in the spaghetti westerns, you see it uh, or some version of it in the movie like The Wild Bunch and other Peck and Paul movies. I think that something that is extremely difficult to show in movies is, is interiority, things that are happening in a character's mind. Um, I would much rather have a zoom to the eyeball than I would a voiceover personally. But that being said, I think that you can convey the same thing with a, a, you know, a little less ham handedly. In the film's defense, I would say that um, trying to do one that was very much of its time, as I said, and two, um, you know, the idea that you would try and give a sense that you're in a character's mind um, or seeing things through his or her eyes was not something that Hollywood was at all interested in doing for its first 25 or 30 years um, as, a, as a consolidated industry. So, um, you know, they were finding their way, but yeah, I agree. It's, it's definitely, uh, um, you know, I marks it as, you know, it's sort of the, uh, you know, the avocado appliance of, uh, of movies. You see that, you know exactly what year the movie came out and you see an avocado dishwasher, you know exactly what year the kitchen was put together in the house you're in. Lisa. Can I, can I add one thing on sure. that? I, I agree with the idea that the Zooms are a little cheesy, but if not for the Zooms, I do not know if we would have all been as exquisitely dazzled by Burt Lancaster's blue, like cerulean blue eyes. Like the, the um, one of the co-stars of Burt Lancaster in this film, uh, Janet Lungard, who plays the, the babysitter, um, she said in an interview that she never realized before the swimmer that Burt Lancaster's eyes were so blue. And there's just such a, a maybe heavy handed, but important reason to, to really zoom in on those pool blue eyes. Um, and I, I think, I think I, I, I fully understand someone saying that the zoom is a little cheesy, but I, I can't imagine the film without that, you know, laser focus on his eyes. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i seen him in a bunch of films and he has close-ups in a lot of his movies and um, yeah, his eyes never stood out like they do in this one. That's certainly true. Uh, Robert, you have a question or comment. Oh, yes, thank you. I wanted to thank Lisa for asking us to read the short story. So I did and I was, I guess, shocked or uh, be only because I was shocked at how the screenwriter uh, changed and added to the story. Like for example, Lucinda, I'll give you the examples and, and you guys tell me, um, Lucinda, Lucinda is his wife and she actually appears in the story as a character and actually speaks. And I don't believe that Lucinda appeared in the movie. Right. Number two. The young girl, the former babysitter who had a huge crush on Bert, that was completely added by the screenwriter, did not appear, added that character. The screenwriter added the character of the boy selling the lemonade that you referred to. Uh, Robert, Robert, you're absolutely right about all of these. 
is, do you have an overarching point about the addition of these? Is do you have a do you appreciate it? Are you critical of it? Well, uh, could I just uh, finish saying what else they added? Or well, we 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 understand what you're saying, and I think a lot of people read the story, so I think a lot of people on this oh. call know. So I'd 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 like to get to your you know the crux of your point about that. Oh sure, I I don't. It's the first time that I've ever read a literary work and then seen the movie right after it. I don't have experience with this. So I don't know whether, it seemed like the additions they made were consistent with the spirit of the story. But I was just shocked that you could, I, I just didn't know whether this is what, what was very common in the, in the movie world that um, people, screenwriters would add completely new characters. Yes. Uh, I, I just didn't know that, so thank you. Sure, yeah, much to the chagrin of um, high school and college students everywhere, um, a movie based on a literary work can be radically different. Um, uh -huh. Uh, a lot of people, I was just saying this to Lisa before we came on, actually, that I, in, to my mind, the best thing an author can hope for, and I've actually heard some authors comment on this, is not that every character will be depicted or nothing will be added or nothing will be changed, but that the tone and mood, or as you put it, the spirit of the original work will come through on screen. And I think that's exactly what happens here to the credit of the Perrys and Eleanor Perry in particular. Um, and I would also say that I think that you'll find that it's very common for short stories to be made into feature films and for that to be done quite well. Uh, to mention two examples, um, Blade Runner was a Philip K. Dick short story and Brokeback Mountain was based on a short story as well. And a short story really is the appropriate literary um, source for a feature film because a novel has far too much information in it, characters, plots, time span, whatever you want to call it, for a two hour feature film um, in most cases. Um, short stories often have just the right amount. This tends to be a shorter short story, so there is room to add things, but I think they were consistent with the spirit of the story and only enhanced the our ability to get a sense of what Ned is going through, which is what the author was was trying to convey. Lisa. I, I agree. And, and John Cheever uh, approved enough of this is faithful in spirit and in a lot of ways faithful in, in plot too. Uh, he approved of this adaptation so much that he, he actually has a cameo in the film. He's the, uh, uh, the guy passed out on the uh, inner tube in the pool, the life of the party, uh, which is interesting because I, uh, I believe John Cheever also suffered from alcoholism, so a little ringing true, too true maybe. Um, yeah, it it was a very faithful adaptation in terms of the the themes and the tone, and perhaps to the the detriment of the film and in some people's minds. Um, very faithful in the heavy-handed symbolism. Yeah, I think symbolism in literature is so much easier and subtle on the, the mind's eye <laughs> than it is in the, the eye eye if you're watching it on screen. Um, but, but the Cheever short story is kind of dripping <laughs> in symbolism. Um, it's, it's pretty heavy, but of course, because it's a short story and it's text and it's happening in your mind, it's, it's very elegant and delicate. Um, but the the Perry's definitely uh, carried through with his heavy symbolism as well, trotting out the horse and the pools and uh, all all the good stuff. Uh, but yes, a very successful adaptation, and it sounds like you enjoyed comparing the two. And the other thing I would say is that you know the the addition of the former babysitter fits perfectly with the midlife crisis theme fits perfectly with the fact that he's he's thinking of his kids at a different age than they are because he's thinking that his life is at a different phase than it is and, and she's a, a great way to convey that. But most importantly, there's a whole middle stretch of the movie where they're having conversations 
and in those conversations, we learn things about what he's seeing and what he's feeling and how he's thinking about things, which can be conveyed in prose in a, in a story. And, and that's how a story works. And we don't think twice of it. Imagine if that whole middle section, he was by himself and we had either no dialogue and just had to rely on those images or we had a voiceover or heaven forfend, we had more zooms into his eyeball. Then we would all be wishing, why didn't the Eleanor Perry add another character so he could say some of these things and there could be a back and forth that would illuminate some things. So I think there's a case where the nature of it being a film kind of necessitated the invention of a character. And frankly, none of his peers were going to go on that journey with him because they would all be too concerned about feeling silly. Um, and a, a young uh, a young college age person who had at one point had a crush on this man um, would be less concerned with that and might see this as sort of an odd lark. And so, it, and that, that seems um, uh, feasible to me. Um, is v Valerie, is this Valerie Temple from Ohio Valerie Temple? It is. Hey, Valerie. It's me. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I was so excited to see you do, do the swimmer for this week. So I had to stop by, uh, sure. and, cause I love this fantastically, uh, strange movie. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, my, my question specifically is sort of about uh, the adaptation um, uh, it, in regards to the passage of time and how it's communicated in the story versus the film. Um, I feel like in the story, there's sort of a, there's sort of like an illusion at a, a point where like all of a sudden, it's the the trees are like fall, you know, there's, it, it seems like there's a, this symbolic kind of passage of time, but in the, the film, it, it feels very much like it's all taking place in one day and we're just sort of in the middle of a breakdown where he's this person where it's almost as if he's dropped in from nowhere and we don't know where he's come from or where he's been. But as we go through the day, we sort of learn that he's sort of um, like, he doesn't, his memory, he doesn't know where he's been or either. So um, it's as if, it's as if the last, I don't know, 10 years of his life are a mystery to him. And I just sort of wanted to get your thoughts on how that's presented. Well, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I agree with your take on it. And um, I think that the, even though he meets a lot of the same people in the film as he does in the story, I think the dialogue in the film, those people are making it much clearer that it's all the same day, saying things about how, oh, we're going over to the so-and-so's house, or haven't you heard so-and-so's having a party, or, you know, what have you. And I think that um, th that makes it hard to ignore that this, at least to those people, this is all the same day. Um, and I'm not sure um, what difference that makes compared to the stories, uh, the short stories, more sort of amorphous passage of time. Um, but I agree with you that it, it's, there's probably something there that, that should be considered. Lisa. I, I agree with you as well, Valerie. I think there's a, a distinction between the two, um, even though you could dig into the film and kind of pry out something that would be more analogous to the, the, the short stories passage of time. I think you have to dig a little bit deeper to make that connection. But to me, the, the strongest through line of the short story is this, this kind of surreal concept that Ned is passing through an entire lifetime in the course of this, you know, afternoon um, from, you know, youth. Um, oh, he was described so well. He, he had the idea of like, he felt like clement weather or something I think is in the, the short story, such a lovely phrase. Um, so it's, to me, even though there's so much more you can dig out of the short story, the strongest through line is this 
aging, this, you know, youth passing into old age and possibly death. Um, the film, on the other hand, I, I think that you can almost, if you want to like do the math a little bit, you could think that there's maybe a two to three or four year period that's just kind of missing from Ned's memory. And he is probably having some sort of mental break <laughs> or, or episode um, because he, he's tried so hard to suppress bad memories, anything that goes against his own self-perception. Um, that being said, I, I do love, and I think someone brought this up in a, a comment that they emailed in, I love how the film, in my, in my opinion, imp improves upon the opening of John Cheever's story uh, in that Ned does appear out of absolute nowhere. He appears from nature. He's, you know, this, this godlike creature that then is birthed in this co concrete <laughs> womb uh, by, div you know, diving into the, the first pool. And then, you know, his, his body does degrade through the course of this afternoon. And you could definitely even, you know, dig into uh, you know, Greek mythology illusions and think that he is, you know, passing through the river Styx instead of the river Lucinda. And then he's finally reaching, you know, his house that pointedly does not have a pool and looks like a cemetery. And, you know, maybe he's dead, you know, but, but I think you have to dig a little bit further to get that out of the film than what is clearly someone who has a few years missing and is starting to figure out that he has a few years missing. I think it's also a much harder thing to pull off from a filmmaking point of view, particularly at that time, if he is literally supposed to be going through time and time is passing and he is aging, as I think you could argue is implied in the story, that would be much harder to do um, in the movie for a host of reasons. And so I think having him sort of be out of time or to be missing time rather than to have time passing rapidly um, makes was a smart choice from a practical production point of view, um, but also, you know, gives gives the story a bit more mystery and, and mythology to it, I think. Um, you know, there's a, you, you, anytime you see something in a movie, um, you want to ask yourself, you know, people don't typically put things in movies that, that don't belong there. Um, so when we, this movie starts and we see all those animals, right? Why are we seeing all those animals? And I think it's precisely for the reason Lisa just said that this movie is a bit different than the story and that he's sort of this elemental creature that is born, you know, he's, he's out of nature or into nature. And um, in some sense, he is this man, Ned, that these people know, but in another sense, he's, he's something else. And that makes it the story a bit different, I think. Uh, Diane, you have a question or comment. Yeah, um, so I really did like this movie quite a bit. And um, I mean, clearly time was a big element. And I, when I read the story, I really did relate to the, the issue of, of the climb, the aging process, and he gets weaker and weaker. And in the movie, he sprains his ankle, but, but clearly he's losing, um, he's losing energy. Um, uh, throughout the whole thing. But I thought the invention of Kevin, uh, the kid with the lemonade stand, was a way of maybe humanizing um, Ned, uh, showing that he, besides being this explorer, this pilgrim, he was also kind of looking for, uh, or wanted there to be meaning to his life. And this desire to help people, whether it's Julie or Kevin, um, it just kind of made him a bit more, more human and not just um, kind of reckless and, and crazy and, and just swimming from pool to pool, but, but actually somebody who had some more depth to him. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it was humanizing. I think it also, you know, he's clearly, his daughters are important to him, uh, clearly, and it seems like they are no longer in the picture based on everyone's reaction to his claim that they're at the house playing tennis. And so I think that 
um, I think seeing him with this young boy, um, you know, sort of cemented some of that portion of his character. Lisa. I, uh, I do agree that the film is giving him some moments along the way to appear as human, as, you know, as empathetic as possible for this, you know, cheating, horrible guy, I guess. Uh, but I, I, and I do think that he, he is someone that has the capacity, especially drawn to, to innocence. I think he is drawn to Kevin and um, is empathetic for Kevin, perhaps even because he, he sees a little bit of himself uh, in this young boy. But on the flip side, I also find that scene so interesting um, because even though Ned is, you know, it, it imparting what could be construed as, you know, decent, encouraging advice, he's also imparting his own psychosis to this kid when, when he says, you know, um, if you if you believe it hard enough, it's true, <laughs> and that's that's the the issue here is that he believes in his own, um, you know, splendidness, his own uh, you know self confidence to such an extent that he's oblivious to how others see him and and how his life is in shambles. So I really thought that scene was so well done because he he is a you know, he has some carrying qualities to him. And when he hears the boy jumping on the um, I forgot. diving board, thank you, the diving board. When he hears the boy jumping on the diving board, he runs back because he, you know, he thinks that he uh, has, you know, convinced him that if you do believe in it, it's true. And the the child just kind of matter of factly says, "There's no water. I'm not going to dive in it." And that to me is mirrored in in Julie's you know, childlike um, wonder and his, his, you know, kooky idea to swim across the county. And, but then once she realizes that he's a little too far in the clouds, even for her, then she leaves and backs away. And so the, I, I appreciate that the film does allow some, some sympathy for Ned um, but I think you can read that scene a couple different ways as well. Uh, Ellen, you have a question or comment. On me. Okay. Uh, yeah, my interpretation, well, I got the river sticks out of it. And then I figured, why would he be crossing the sticks? And then I decided, this is a weird idea, that he's really been dead for about 10 years. They sent him back across the sticks from purgatory. And he had to redeem himself because he seems to have been a really bad man. And all of these attempts to humanize himself or attempts to um, reach redemption. And he got one day to do it. And by the end, I have no idea if it was accepted. So that's... I, I think that's a really, I think that's a really interesting idea. I mean, the movie would have to um, sort of agree to the conceit that the, all the people he encounters recognize that things are different than he says they are, but are somehow willing to forget that he's, he's dead. But I understand why you think that because it seems like he's going back to situations he's been in before and he's talking about his family in the right way, even though we look, come to learn he didn't sort of live his family life in the right way. So I, I think that's a very interesting way to think about it. Maybe, you know, this is his, his hope, his dream of being able to redo things. Lisa. You can, you can dig out anything you want from this movie and, and that's the fun of it. <laughs> It's, it's not a fun movie, but it, it is fun to kind of plug in little things here and there. Um, you know, once you've seen it, and I, I highly recommend everyone watch it again as well, because more and more things will reveal to you now that you know where it's going. Um, and I, I play that, I play that game too, where I kind of plug in things here and there. And I've 
you know, made the, the connection that the, um, the son of the, the woman who t tells him never to come back to her house, that I have made the connection that his daughters got in some kind of drunken car crash and killed him. So it's, there's so much that you can plug in and, um, you know, extrapolate out from this film. And I, I really appreciate that, um, that analysis that, that you gave us. Lillian, you have a question or comment. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't see this movie as a, anything realistic. I mean, this, like something happening really in time. Um, you know, where does this guy come from? I think Lisa said this before. Where does this guy come from? He didn't get to that house in a car. He has no shoes on. Um, and then off we go on this on this journey with him. Um, it, it's very allegorical to me. Um, I think Burt Lancaster was wonderful. I have loved him ever since I saw him in The Killers. But, um, you know, and by the way, he was he was a um, circus acrobat at one time, so he's he's a really physical person. But I, I don't I don't see this movie as something real. I don't know if it's like the Twilight Zone. I don't I don't know where exactly to put it. But to me, this is I I have a hard time thinking about this story as you know some realistic story that's taking place. And as far as as far as his uh, thing with the babysitter, I, I think um, that's, a, that's a good insight into his character who, you know, who, a guy who wasn't a faithful husband. This is the 60s. I'm sure a lot of you were around then. And, uh, you know, people behaved in, I'm, I'm sure they still do, but people behaved in very strange ways. And, uh, I, I sometimes I thought to myself, and maybe it's a terrible thing to think, that he wondered why um, he never saw the babysitter as somebody he could hit on when she was a teenager and he was the father of the children she was taking care of. But but to me, this 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 was this was all reliving right. all, all the things in his life and you know, and, and then you get reality at the end when he arrives at this house. I mean, it's over. He's done it. He's, he's um, you know, he's failed, obviously, in his business dealings. He's failed in his marriage. He failed with his mistress. His, his life is over. He's collapsing. Yes. Thank you, Lillian. I, I think you're right. I, I mean, I think what people have been saying is... I, I, is that there is something you know allegorical or spiritual or metaphysical or something going on here and and precisely what or how I think to some extent is left vague in order to be subjective uh, to have subjective appeal to to viewers I would think. Um, Faiza, you have a question or comment. Yes, I really like this movie. This was the second time I saw it. I believe you had it in one of your survey classes in the mm -hmm. past year or two. And I got so much more out of it this time around. And I don't think this was a vision of realism in filmmaking. This, although it was very real to me, it wasn't a midlife crisis movie. It was closer to an end of life type of movie where this man was self-reflective and was reflecting on his youth, on his now and on where he's going, where he's headed, cutting through the BS and superficiality of the lives of people who reject him, who in comparison to him seem so pathetic. All they can talk, he wants to go home, quote unquote, having reflected on his life. Um, and all they can talk about is whether they're gonna add a cushion to the seat of their lawnmower or the water purification system of their pool. And you just feel so bad for them. And clearly he's onto something else on some other level and on another dimension. On, on, in terms of the visuals, I really loved it. Every um, frame to me looked like a photograph of the famed photographer, Slim Ahrens, who used to photograph the beautiful life and the life of 
the jet setters and, and beautiful people. And again, that just brought home the point that, you know, this is, the, this is a two dimensional life looks very pretty on the outside, but but again, boy, is it empty and pathetic. And he's trying to cut through all of that and he's trying to get somewhere else. And yes, he reflects on his youth, on maybe mistakes he made, the leaps he was taking with the young girl and he lands on the wrong foot and starts limping and later shivering. I think the young girl um, was a great way. And Andrew, I don't know if this is what you would call a MacGuffin, but it was a great way of moving the dialogue and the story along so we could learn more about him at a different time. Um, and again, I didn't need there to be a chronology of Bert Lancaster, younger, middle-aged and older. He reviewed all of his life before us and we got to see it. And I felt like it gave me an opportunity to um, reflect on a similar journey in my life. So on, on that point, I think it was a very meaningful and beautiful movie. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think it's difficult to strike a balance where you have a figure, uh, one primary figure who's a particular type. I mean, Burt Lancaster is a particular type of man. Um, that is the focus of the film. And it's about all these sort of, you know, personal and existential types of things. But the film is open enough to allow people who are nothing like Burt Lancaster um, to uh identify and find things in it to you know to f make them want to follow along on the journey the other thing i would say and this was sort of implicit in what Faiza was saying and it's been made explicit by some of the comments in the chat um i, I think this film is also meant to be a, a critique of a society um of american society and particularly the upper middle class um, segments of American society and many of the people who at that time were living there and, and that in some sense is a criticism the graduate is making also and so I think that while this movie you, you, you can't help but think about it as being about an individual and things an individual might go through it is also about more than that it is also a, about it's also a much broader cultural critique as well I think Lisa Faiza, I loved your comments. So many interesting things you, you brought up there. And to kind of bridge your comment with it, the last one. Um, yes, I mean, this is so allegorical, but th there's, there's, so, there's so much mundane reality in the surreal in this film. Um, and, and part of that is, is the, the imagery that, that you uh, described so well as this you know, photograph of the jet set. Um, the the opening, even I would say even maybe the first twenty minutes or so, feels extra real, like to, to the point that you you want to like flee <laughs> to to a big city or something, um, because of the the surreal nature of the 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 acting of the um, the score of the, the sheen, the kind of photographic sheen of the, um, the quality of the, the visuals and, and the dialogue. It's all, it, it's almost like it's, it's like some Coca-Cola ad, like it's, it's kitsch. Um, but to me, that makes it so much more real and repulsive in a way. Um, and I, I feel like, yes, um, the, the director is definitely critiquing American society and, and values, um, but is also kind of giving some indication as to, to why people would seek that out as well um, with that, that kind of sheen and uh, fun quality that when it's, it's accumulating over say the first 20, 30 minutes, it becomes absolutely repulsive after a while. Um, yeah, lots of interesting things to, uh, to talk about there. Thank you for the comments. Joss, you have a question or comment. Oh, so much to talk about for this strange, interesting movie. Um, a lot of which you know, relating it to the short story um, has already been discussed. Just that the short story seemed much simpler, more of a fable or parable as compared to this more fleshed out film, which had, as Lisa had mentioned in her intro, almost this epic, quality to it. 
uh, as I watch the film, which I saw before I read the story this week, um, I had different. I found it difficult watching Burt Lancaster in this role. Um, you know, his, my image of him has always been uh, this robust, vigorous man from all of the roles he had before that. Um, his acrobatics in the Crimson Pirate or his, um, you know, his heroic qualities in Gunfight at the OK Corral or something like that. Uh, and I know he was, a, he was a major player in getting this movie made. And I just wondered if there had been any thoughts given to casting somebody else or was this his baby? Any comments? Um, I, I don't, I don't think there was um, uh, any, I think this was his baby in many, many senses. I, I can imagine that having him in this film would have been a, a key element in getting it made, given how, um, you know, challenging of a movie it is by Hollywood narrative standards, even of the late 1960s. Um, what I don't understand is why it would be difficult to see him in this part. I think the physicality that he was known for was there and was essential to this part and that sort of robust quality. But at the same time, you know, we saw him in a film earlier in the series, uh, another one of Lisa's favorites, A Sweet Smell of Success, that he could be unsavory with the, with the worst of them. So um, it seems to me that, that he was a very good choice uh, for the part. Um, Lisa, do you know anything about his involvement in the production? Yeah, um, so initially when the Perrys brought this project to Sam Spiegel, um, it was going to be a small budget, like $500,000 small budget, um, shot with kind of no-name actors, you know, New York theater people. But then Sam Spiegel decided he wanted a star. And Burt Lancaster was I, I did read that he was not the first person that was considered. Um, William Holden was considered for the part. Um, I think George C. Scott also was, but Burt Lancaster uh, was very taken with the role. And I mean, he he became so involved that he even bankrolled some of the the post production shoots. So this this is definitely. I, I can't imagine it with anyone else um, because it, and you were pointing out some of his, his earlier films. It, this role brings with it the weight and the heft of his body being on display for 20, 30 odd years at that point. And I don't want to sound lecherous when I talk about a man's body, but his, his body is so much a part of what makes him Burt Lancaster. He is this godlike figure. I mean, he, he is, Andrew, maybe you have another suggestion, but I can't think of a, a more iconic uh, masculine symbol of American virility <laughs> than Burt Lancaster, uh, especially in the, you know, the iconic from here to eternity beach scene. I mean, his, his, in the, you know, swashbuckling pirate movies you've mentioned his his body in all of his films has this three dimensionality to it that he he wields and even in something like sweet smell of success which is so impressive when you consider his role because of how his body is coiled and not on display which makes it even scarier um his body is central to, to me to what makes him Burt Lancaster and to have the this whole metaphysical arena take place on his body in this film it's it's extraordinary it makes the film transcendent to me because it's it does something that the text could never do um which is have have a, a collective consciousness understanding of who this real man playing Ned Merrill is and what we've all attached to him and his iconography. So the the body of Burt Lancaster in this film is it, it's a perfect match. That's all I'll say. 
It, it is a perfect match. And the only other person I think of from that era, that sort of caliber and period of star, um, who also was somewhat known for his body was Kirk Douglas, who it seemed had, uh, you know, written into every contract, he would take his shirt off. Um, I don't know whether um, people wanted him to, or he insisted, but it seemed to happen. I mean, paths of glory, he's in a world war one, you know, trench uh, hovel and he's got his shirt off. And I can't imagine that was very comfortable. Um, but at the same time, I don't think of Kirk Douglas as nearly as substantial of a man physically as Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster seemed, there was that point where he in, he talked, he was making fun of his ex-mistress's splinter and called it a redwood. He's the one who seems like a redwood, you know, tall and broad and thick and tan um, in this movie. And um, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think there are men who are known for being physically imposing, but you didn't typically see their body per se. I mean, I feel like you rarely, if ever, saw John Wayne's body on display, for example. Um, so I think that I think that his physicality, I think he was really sort of um, rare of that era in doing that, in part because their you know, bodies weren't shown as much in various states of undress. But I think between this film and From Here to Eternity, there's a good case to be made that he was uh, at the forefront of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kenneth, you have a question or comment? Yes, I, I was kind of torn. Um... I really like the way the film was done, how they, uh, how things changed in the early scenes. It seemed like every pool he stopped in, people were happy to see him. They were old friends. They wanted him to stay longer, to do things together. And then as the movie went on, uh, the people were not so happy to see him. We kept hearing about how he always was looking for money from people. Um, I think that long scene with Shirley, his, his ex-mistress, was a real turning point. And I, I found it somewhat troubling. Like we kind of knew at that point that this was not headed for a happy ending. Uh, that there was, it was kind of, it reminded me a little of 12 Angry Men and that as the film went on, you discovered more and more things going on. Uh, and when he got back to his house, I expected to see Rod Serling step out and, and give a narrative about it. And um, I was wondering, was there any discussion back then about what happened to his wife and daughters? Were they uh, assumed that they just left him? Were they killed in an accident? Because at one point he said, oh, no, I couldn't drive. I couldn't go in a car. Uh, and what happened? So I and I found I think I found the scenes with the babysitter maybe a little troubling, too. How he, um, you know, he was obviously interested in the physical relationship, too. And she was still a teenager at that point. So. Uh, as I said, there were, it was a mix of troubling things, but I did like the way they put it together and how each scene kind of built up on what you knew about him. Because I agree, he seemed to be dropped in from nowhere and then go to nowhere at the end. Yeah, I, I think you, you said a number of interesting things there, Ken. I think the most uh, interesting thing you said, and, and you've gotten some sort of amens from the, from the chat, is that um, the sort of people's take on him gets sort of worse. He's he's greeted less and less warmly and then increasingly coldly and with hostility as the movie goes on. And I think that that um, I, I think that's an important thing to to note and to think about. And what is changing over the course of the time is he he's getting closer to his home ostensibly. So does that mean the people who are in closer proximity to him, who have had better chance to observe him, who maybe are more familiar with him, like him less? Or is it that as he gets closer to the source of his upset, that he's at greater his greater unease and that's manifests itself through the way these people treat him. Um, it's hard to know exactly, but it is obviously, it is clearly, I shouldn't say obviously, it is clearly an intentional pattern. And one I think that um, is worth, worth thinking about. Lisa. Uh, I will just note that the second pool he dives into, he gets a extremely nasty uh, welcome. But not welcome at all. <laughs> in in this in the short story, it follows that arc beautifully. People are happy to see him in the beginning, and then um, I, I think the Binswangers snub him, and then his old mistress snubs him. But I love the way that the film kind of plays around with um, you know people who hate him, who like him, because one of the strengths of the film is that 
um, you know, the, the, the community in which he lives and fancies himself, I guess, the alpha of and somewhat a part of, um, they're all more um, fleshed out than they are in the short story. It's sort of kind of dim peripheral characters in the story. Um, but you, you really get um, kind of a reflection of the, the men, <laughs> the various types of men he comes across. And then the, the women really, for the most part, the women really pierce him and break down his shell. And you know, Julie's abandonment of him kind of weakens him and then Shirley Abbott just stabs him and that he sort of ends him in that way. Um, so I, I, I like that the, the story and the film are kind of different in that respect because it, it makes it more about the, the community as well in the film rather than just Ned's self journey. Yeah, that's a good point. I'd forgotten about that, the mother of whoever, of the boy that gives him that extremely nasty reception early on. You're absolutely right. Uh, Dana, you have a question or comment. I do. Um, and my head is spinning because there is so much to talk about in this film that many people have talked about. Um, the scene that really got to me, got me in the gut was the moment when Burt Lancaster was walking across the street in the midst of all the traffic in his um, little speedo bathing suit after having done some swimming and then he has some ahead of him. And at that point I said, I don't really know if I think this story is really his story. I'm, I'm finding this lately in movies that ancillary things are striking me. And I think that what I, what I, what I came to is that this movie's really about suburbia in the 60s. Um, we've talked about this so, so far today quite a lot, but um, he epitomizes a lot of it, but, but there's a lot of it swirling around. And when I watched this movie, I thought about The Graduate constantly. And uh, although women seem to be like Mrs. Robinson's to me in some form or other, what struck me though too about this movie is that in the midst of the suburbia, which, which appeared to be so negative, I mean, so superficial, so um, I, I don't even want to look for other adjectives, but, but, but not, not, very, not very pleasing in any kind of way. Out of that come the two children, the babysitter and the little boy, who, as we've mentioned, have, were not in the short story, which was a great short story. And I kind of saw them as hope for the future. Um, when the little boy didn't throw himself off of the diving board and Burt Lancaster was surprised and he had no intention of it, I thought there's something to be said about this little boy. Same thing with the babysitter. Um, she, after talking about her lengthy crush, when he came on to her, that little girl stood up to him and turned on him and I thought, Good for you, both of you children, enmeshed in this in this society, there's hope for our future. I mean, this may be coming out of I don't know where, but I just really felt very positive about the two children images in this environment. Um, that's just one thought of many, but I just that that's the one I wanted to throw out there. Well, thanks, Dana. I think that's interesting. I mean, you're right. The two young people that we see in the film. Um, for any amount of time that he interacts with for any amount of time are not buying what he's selling ultimately. Lisa. Frank and Eleanor Perry have, their filmography is I'd say hit and miss, but the, the one strong through line is their really sensitive and thoughtful depictions of adolescence. And I think that carries through strongly as, as you've talked about, so eloquently in, in this film as well, even though it's, you know, it's, it's about, it's about suburbia. It's about, you know, this man and his compatriots and people have mentioned The Graduate throughout this chat. And I, I, I wonder if, you know, The Graduate, because there's a lot of dissimilar themes, a lot of similar milieu. I wonder if The Graduate succeeded because its main character wasn't so enmeshed in its uh, milieu that it, the film was critiquing. Um, I, I maybe it, it's just it's a weird time for this swimmer to come out because it's you know the, the, it's too weird for the establishment and it's uh, it's too, maybe too square <laughs> too classic Hollywood for 
the, you know, the kids going to see the graduate. Uh, it's, just, it's a fascinating time for it to come out. Um, yeah, lots of, I, I could go on for hours to address everything you've said. The, the scene on the highway as well, I love the editing in that scene. Um, the editing gets quicker and quicker as the, the film um, draws closer to its end. And it's sort of epitomized in, in that scene, which is just so disorienting and upsetting uh, in, in its editing. So yeah, it's a great film. Um, Meredith, you have a question or comment. Yeah, you mentioned those extraneous elements always being worth talking about. And I just wanted to ask you um, about a couple of them, especially Lisa, because with um, Sweet Smell of Success, we were talking about the kind of the kinkiness around Burt Lancaster. Um, and just like the first scene when he, you know, he says, don't you remember when we used to slip off our suits and swim up the river? So I was curious about that because I don't see the homoeroticism in the Cheever story. And then the second thing is like, there's a lot of like foot imagery you know, like at the, in that scene, he picks up the woman's feet and, you know, then there's like the issues with its own limps and being limp and being forced to wash his feet. So I just wondered if you had any, any readings of that, since we're really getting into close readings of the details in this film. Well, the only thing I would say about the, the feet is that it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, someone saying in the comment, so much feet on par with Tarantino. I was actually right, going right. to refer to Tarantino to in Pulp Fiction, where Samuel L. Jackson and John DeVolt are having a talk about the, the Marcellus Wallace bodyguard who supposedly was thrown off the roof of a building for giving Mrs. Wallace a foot massage because supposedly the neat things about foot massages are that you can say they don't mean anything, but everyone knows they do. And I think this film is using that to show... Um, physical intimacy and familiarity in a way that can be conveyed out in the open. And I, I think that that's, I think that's what that is. Um, and his comfort with it uh, and his seeming interest in it, I think shows his sort of, you know, it, it's kind of a stand in for, you know, his flirtatiousness and his, you know, could even say his lecherousness. Um, Lisa, what do you think? Um I don't know that much about John Cheever, but I do know that um, he was bisexual and I don't necessarily read that in the story either, but I, I definitely, Meredith, see uh, some, some elements of what you're talking about in the, the film. Um, to me, Burt Lancaster in the performance, I could just talk forever about how great it is, but there are, there are layers upon layers upon layers. Burt Lancaster is playing a, a man, lowercase m, who's playing the man with, you know, uppercase m. And it's just this, this grandiose oozing of sexuality icon of, of masculinity. And, and he, he almost can't help but um, rub it in his paunchy friends' faces, the male friends, as well as, you know, flirt shamelessly and, and not just feet, but smacking Kim Hunter's butt. <laughs> like, he's, he's very, uh, he's very forward. And I, I love that it is the females in the film that get to puncture that grandiosity so my thoughts on that uh janice antner you have a question or comment yes i do uh i agree with so much of that's been said but i wanted to say that when i first watched the movie before i started to think about all of the rest of it and why this was in the film and why that was in the film what i thought this was about was an incredible depiction of a nervous breakdown. Uh, the beginning when he was looking at the sun and everything in the world seemed beautiful, seemed like the manic phase of someone who, who was manic depressive, or I believe today they call it schizophrenic rather than that, and spiraling to a downward stage. And it would explain how he appeared from nowhere, that he had been in a mental institution before that. And who knows how much time went by when he was there so that his house is this ruin now. And uh, 
that in no way takes away for me from all of the rest of it, as far as it being uh, comments on, on uh, suburban society and, and everything else that was said. But for me, this movie was about the de depiction of a nervous breakdown. I uh, thank you, Janice. I certainly think that that interpretation is there. Um, I think particularly in the latter portions of the film, there seems to be, he seems to be under great strain and things seem to be getting to him and there seems to be some disorientation. So um, I think the film's totally open to that reading. Lisa. You, you do have to wonder what asylum he escaped from that he's only hanging around in his swim shorts. <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel like that's a, a very, um, valid understanding and takeaway from the film. You you really feel his confusion and his upset at not knowing what people are. Not even telling him directly. Like the, what I love about this film in terms of its its suburban milieu and, and critique is that it, every, everyone is bought in to the niceties. And if you if you lubricate it all with alcohol some crazy guy in a pair of shorts can come to your pool and start talking about how the driveway is full of male suitors for your daughters. And that's okay, even though you all know that a couple guys in white, white suits should be coming to take them away. Like, I, I love that, like n never rock the boat with the, the guy who's off uh, sensibility of the, the community that's on display here. But yeah, I, I feel like that's a very, valid takeaway that he is having a mental break. Uh, Janice, you have a question or comment? Um, yeah, so just when when it was brought up that it was, uh, the movie was a lot about social commentary, I just thought it was interesting how none of the upper crusty type people were actually using their pools for swimming, except for Ned. Ned was the standout. He would jump in and swim and the rest of them would stand around and drink. Um, except when he got to the public pool, which was crowded um, with people who clearly didn't have their own pools at home. Uh, so, and they also, you know, weren't the type of people to, um, you know, uh, have the, the niceties to feel like they had to treat him gingerly. They totally did not. They eviscerated him, except for the one man who was trying to calm it down. Um, so yeah, I thought those were interesting differences. And somebody in the chat said that this was, I think Burke Lancaster called it death of a salesman in swimming trunks. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. That's great. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point. And I, I think the, the fact that nobody's in their swimming pool, you know, is class commentary, you know, people of a certain class and station have pools that they don't that they don't use, they have Range Rovers that they don't take off road, they have horses that they don't ride, things like that. And I think that that's, that's part of the class commentary. And it's sort of reinforced by your observations about the, uh, the public pool and how that's a difference. Lisa. It's just a great comment. Um, I, I hadn't really put it that succinctly in, in my own mind, but you're right. The, the swimming pool is this kind of talismanic symbol of wealth and success that, I mean, I guess, I guess the Benzwangers swing and pool party because they're lower in the social strata. They don't even rate on the, the Merrill's Christmas cards list. Um, there, there's, you know, some people <laughs> falling into the pool and, you know, I mean, a grand old time, um, but you, you're very right that there are not people actively enjoying their uh, symbol of wealth. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I think we had a, a really great discussion um, of a very interesting film, and I hope you will join us for subsequent ones. Um, we have some of our Tuesday night uh, remote classroom seminars coming up, one tomorrow night on The Wire, uh, then in a couple of weeks, uh, another uh, latest in our short film series, uh, then Jennifer Flieger on the uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, woman filmmaker Dorothy Arzner, and then I'll be talking about uh, American cinema in the 1950s. 
Um, we will also have one of these discussions almost every Monday, uh, and you can find out about that and everything else we have going on, including our Ask Andrew segments and other film studies things in the Film Studies Online section of BrynMarFilm.org. And if you sign up for our emails, every Thursday you will get an email with a uh, that identifies what the film to be discussed the following Monday is, a link to how you can find out where you can rent it, and most importantly, a link to the introduction by our wonderful instructors, just like the one you watched for this by Lisa. Uh, so we hope you will join us then. We hope you will visit BrynMarFilm.org and sign up for our emails. And if you like everything that we're doing, until we're able to open and have great movies to show you, uh, please consider making a donation to uh, allow us to hit the ground running when we are able to open and resume full regular operations. Until then, uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, continually in our Theater 5 and Film Studies Online. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank Yay. you, Lisa. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Great discussion.